Welcome back to The Breakfast Club. Our person of interest today is someone who blends cutting-edge science with ancient Indian wisdom. Professor P. R. Mukund is an electrical engineer. He spent decades in the US working on advanced semiconductor technologies. Hmm. But some of his most fascinating work is rooted right here in India. He's built a one-of-a-kind archival technology we're going to be talking a little bit about here on the show. It's called Wafer Fish and it can preserve centuries-old palm leaf manuscripts in a form that's fireproof, waterproof and built to last forever. Now, isn't that the kind of tech you absolutely love? Professor Mukund's work goes beyond just hardware. His books explore Vedic ideas, success, dharma and the kind of wisdom modern life often leaves behind. Today, we talk to him and the person who's preserving India's also oldest knowledge systems with the help of the sharpest technologies that he's building. So, let's welcome him on the program now. Good morning, Professor Mukund. Thank you so much for joining us. How are you doing this morning? I'm doing good. Good morning to you. It's pretty late at night where I am, but... The professor's oh, joining super. us from Minnesota. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, super. The world, like it says in your background, is the oasis at the moment. So let's just dive in straight. You've had a long academic career in electrical engineering and yet your name is also tied very closely to ancient Indian wisdom. At what point did these two worlds begin to overlap for you? Um, actually, uh, at the outset, I should uh, thank you for uh, inviting me to your show. Um, a lot of people think that uh, somehow the modern Western science, if you will, uh, and the so-called ancient Vedic wisdom are somehow very two separate things. Um, knowledge is knowledge, and I think that uh, there are a lot of not only commonalities, but uh, uh, one can help the other. And um, so that thought did not occur to me uh, in vacuum. Uh, actually, my guru, he told me that in 2003. So to answer your question, it's been more than two decades. And he specifically said that, look, uh, you have one foot over here and one foot over there. So you need to sort of do what you can to build a bridge. Uh, and uh, so in my own little humble way, I've been trying to do that. Sweet. So what is, we told our audiences earlier, wafer fish, and we've, okay, we've broken it down and we've simplified it. And we've said it's a silicon-based data storage tech. But what does that actually mean? What is wafer fish? Tell us that. Why did you think that this is the need of the hour? And there are some comparisons to technology that NASA is using. What mm. does that mean? Just break it down for us. Yeah, well, actually, um, I need to just take a step backwards, if you will. Uh, there's a difference between uh, storing knowledge and storing manuscripts. Hmm. You know, just because you preserve uh, a manuscript doesn't mean that you have preserved knowledge. Uh, for the simple reason that there are many different lippies, uh, scripts that are used in uh, ancient uh, uh, manuscripts. And uh, some of them, there are very few people who can actually even read those things. And uh, so there are a lot of issues there. So I'll skip all of that and come directly to talk about the preservation of the manuscript itself, right? And so when you look at a manuscript also, you can say, when I say I want to preserve it, am I talking about preserving the original uh, media, whatever that might be, um, or do I want to actually preserve what has been recorded there? And the two are slightly different things. For example, if you take a thousand year old uh, palm leaf manuscript, let's say, right? So after all these years, you know, uh, it's not in prime condition, obviously. They are biodegradable, many of these things. So the question is, do you want to keep on preserving that for whatever reason or do you want to extract the image that has been embedded in that medium and transform it into another medium that will last for a long long time hmm. right so um in that regard uh if you look at palm leaf manuscripts which is very commonly used uh especially in the southern part of india because obviously you know palm trees are there in plenty so that's what they use and uh, so the way actually things were written on that 
is engraving. It's not actually written uh, with a sharp metal object. They actually engrave that and then filled it with some vegetable ink, right? So what happens over time after many centuries is that uh, the ink fades away, for example, uh, the medium becomes brittle and so on. So when you want to preserve what is actually embedded in that, the image that is embedded in that. So if you think of the writing as an image, right? Now the question is, how can you faithfully extract that image First, you have to extract the image, then do whatever processing you want to do and map it back onto another medium without losing any data, of course. Mm. And that has to stay for however long, right? So that is the, it's a three-step process, right? And you mentioned uh, wafer fish. That's one of the technologies. We work with different technologies, uh, including uh, paper. Uh, for example, uh, we... Uh, by the way, we have saved about uh, 3,300 manuscripts as of now, right? And in our, we run a, I have a uh, non-profit trust in India and that was started in 2008. So in these years, we have saved more than 3,300 manuscripts. Hmm. And so those things, one of the things we do is uh, we map <clears throat> it into archival paper and which is the same paper that on which the Constitution of India has been written. Mm -hmm. It's uh, uh, totally 100% cotton, mm -hmm. acid-free, but even that lasts maybe, uh, I guess, maybe 150 to 200 years, right? Uh, so we need to find other medium. Mm -hmm. And looking at the wafer fish, which you mentioned, uh, it's a very unique um, technology in the sense that in, uh, when uh, man was sent to land on the moon many years ago by NASA, they wanted to leave a time capsule on the moon. Oh, uh, so this is I'm like no that. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah, I, well, I, I didn't know. I don't know who they expected to come and dig it up and read. But anyway, they wanted to do that, right? So this technology is very, very similar to that. Hmm. And what it is, if I can very briefly explain it to you in a couple of minutes, is that when you take silicon wafer, which is the same material we use, for making computer chips, right? So if you look at a wafer, uh, that medium, all the transistors or what we call active devices are actually embedded in the in the wafer. Now you have to connect all these things. You have to understand that today, if you give me one inch by one inch silicon, I can put billions of transistors there, right? Mm -hmm. And all of these things have to be connected to each other, right? Mm -hmm. So it is a very complicated thing obviously yeah. that is done using metal above the silicon now here comes the interesting thing when metal meets silicon that bonding is so good so so good that it just doesn't separate at all right and also this particular thing is uh, fireproof uh, it is waterproof which are the two things that damage manuscripts the most Mm. And uh, so what we do is we take that image, we reduce it, put it on this wafer, like that image that you're showing right now right. on the right, what I'm seeing. And the, the interesting thing about that is that, let's say uh, five, six hundred years from now, somebody wants to read it, right? You don't need a computer. You don't need any software. Mm. Because God knows what they'll be using at the time. All you need is light and magnification. That's all. I see, I see. This is so, so fascinating, uh, Professor Mukund, love it. But there's another aspect to your work as well, right? Much of your work actually revolves around talking about dharma and integrity. In a professional world, which is often driven by results and optics, how does one actually practice that in today's life? So let's shift the focus from silicon and metal to actual worldly issues now. Yeah, well, <clears throat> you know, I... Uh... Um, these things started somewhat more recently, actually. Uh, what happened is that um, I have many, uh, I've been doing research and guiding students doing PhD and master's and all that for many years. I've supervised more than 82 students. And a good section of them, as you probably can imagine, come from India, graduate mm -hmm. students to do PhD and so on. So one of the things I noticed is that these people who came, they were smart people. They're very, very smart young people. But 
apart from the technical side of things, they were very, very ignorant about life's lessons, right? Um, see, everybody wants to be successful, right? You want to be successful. All of us want to be successful. Nobody starts off saying, let me be a failure, right? But then the question is, how do you define success? That's, a, that's an important thing. And in the Western definition, nothing wrong with it. It's just one definition. If you, for example, uh, become the CEO of a big company, make tens mm. of millions of dollars, all those things, that is defined as success, right? But according to our way of thought, success is multidimensional. And so it includes so many different things and use the word dharma and so we call you know we say sanatana dharma right so eternal values and so the question is how come we who gave it you know thought about it and gave it to this world we ourselves forgot about it right and we are allowing other people to define it for us mm. and so and can i do i have the time to explain give one example of that very quickly in a in a 30 second reel format okay sure so when you start a company how do you define whether the company is successful or not hmm. in in the startup world when you give the business plan they'll say what's your exit strategy right they say how are you getting out hmm. my thing is it's like saying you give birth to a baby and say when will you give it up for adoption right hmm. so a successful parent is one who sees this child grow up to be, be a good adult. Similarly, a successful company, uh, according to us, is if it creates a lot of employment, a lot of things for a lot of people, not just making money for me. So that's the difference between dharma and adharma, I think. That's At least that's my humble opinion. So when people, when you teach people these things, actually they love it. They, believe it or not, they love it. And they adopt it. And I have hundreds of students who are very, very successful people, extremely successful people who live this life every day. Adorable. Absolutely lovely, Professor. We wish we had more time to discuss more about what success means in today's modern world. But we'll leave that for another day. Thank you so much for joining us. So late in the evening for you.